so like this is like rock and roll grad school with like your hosts Heidi Hedquist and Luke Poling and like they've totally got the beat. So may we start? Please. Hello, kitties. Hello. That was that was the number one show in heaven. Are you gonna ruin this for me before Friday? No, I I very much am not going to tell you anything about the show because I don't I want, want to ruin it. But I do want you to tell me. I'm very it, torn. Well, here's what I can tell you. I sat uh, third or fourth row in the balcony. Yes. On the Ron side, I guess we should say Sparks live and in oh, person. Oh yes. I feel like do our listeners know how much we're obsessed with Sparks, or have we not really told them? I think we have, because I I made a suburban homeboy reference, and and you made fun of me. True. So, third or fourth row balcony, right-hand side, Ron side of the stage. Yes. For the entire show, all I will say is, underneath my mask, I had just a delighted grin on my face the entire time. It's fantastic. It was lovely everything you dreamed it would be when russell sings it oh how he sings it you know what i'm saying yes yes it was it was wonderful and i've seen on all the various uh social medias people saying my god amazing show great show and i was trying to not fall into the trap of being like oh my god this is going to be you know right right it was wonderful so much that the person sitting next to me who I had never met before and we sort of exchanged a no I'm 28 you're 26 here's your seat they go up you wow. know on every other number That's did you ask them to go to cool places with you like I asked I, you to I did not but at the end of the Fine. show we just kind of looked at each other and he was like wow I was like yeah that did was a you good say one this row ain't big enough for the both of us I did not, which is weird because there was only the, the two whole... of us in this row. So the entire theater. Oh, that would have been hilarious. I know. Entire theater, 1,500 seats, apparently sold out. There was a line at the, the box office. I got there early, probably too early, and stood outside. I was the third in. Um, That's amazing. For, but for reserved seats. So it wasn't right. like a bit. Um, with standing next to this woman, who one would not stop talking, had seen them Saturday in D.C., lives in new york was going up to boston and i think she might even be trying to go to both shows um i will give you the advance warning the merch table was pretty picked over okay however when i purchased this they also had a t-shirt similar okay and, and they said we're out of those we only have them in like double xl but we'll be getting more tomorrow to which the person who was standing next to me at the merch table was like and what good does that do me tonight? Right. And they're like, mm. but I, I guess multiple um, people do multiple runs. Not that the set list changes much. Okay. I will just let you know when you're at the merch table, Yes. read all the little tags on everything. Oh, of course. I'm sure. It, and that's all I'm going to say. We can go into more detail later because I know they're playing. I think Detroit's the last U.S. show. Really? I believe it's one of the last and then they're going over to I think Ireland and then the rest of um, the, the rest of Europe. Let me just triple check this here. But there's so much more. Should uh, I wear my spark shirt to the show? You could. All right. So, so I misspoke uh, for tomorrow tonight. God, tonight, night two at town hall in yes. New York, tomorrow, Boston, Friday, Detroit. Michigan, um, Saturday, Ontario, and then they take eight days off Dublin, Belfast, Glasgow, Manchester. Well, no, it is this last US. So, yeah, Brussels, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. So, yes, this is the, the final run of, of North American shows. Um, by the time this comes out, I guess they'll just be. Detroit and Ontario and if yes. you are anywhere near that I highly recommend it I will just say at the end they did promise they would be back soon and as I was uh forcing the children to it, it, something new I tried this morning 
asking the children to get dressed and eat breakfast. Oh, never, never done that one before. How'd that work out? Uh, not great. Took us about oh. 45 minutes. But okay. I did. The elder was all, did they play this? Did they play this? Yes. And I went down the set list and I did say, well, they said they'd be back soon. If they come to Philly, we can go see them because there were several younger sparks uh, in awesome. the crowd. Good. So, and really everybody needs tips for teens. So they really do. Yes. So we can discuss this more later, but okay. after all Friday. I will say, yes. I might be on my way to Ontario though, after Friday. That's true. And then I if, might be on my way to Estonia and Sweden. It's very, very possible. I mean, on the bus, obviously. Ob obviously. And then the author of Forbidden Beat, S.W. Loudon, he also has written a series of punk rock mysteries, which... Yes, which is... Do you need anything else? I mean, come on now. Right. No, that, that town ain't big enough for both of us. True. Um, Isn't there a lot of... No, never mind. Not, nothing. Forget the UPF said it better? <laughs> yes i was thinking wasn't there i was gonna bring it down i don't want to bring it down but wasn't there a lot of isn't taylor like, hawkins in that book people talk a lot about him yeah which that, that's that's very true we should that's what i was have thinking. a tip of the cap yeah um, it's not too sad it's it's I a saw, very sad one and i saw an interesting post somewhere over the weekend where they said that foo fighters were not the greatest band they were the greatest band as far as current bands out there mm -hmm. and sort of like for pure rock bands carrying the torch of just straight ahead no frills rock music they are th that's it and also a couple folks were making the case that he is the last drummer of note where you knew his name yeah and I, part of me is like, Max Weinberg, does that count? Well, it's different, but he, it's different. And he, he would did other stuff. Right. And as Taylor Hawkins was just solely a great drummer. Right. And that's all he did was drum very, very well. Very well. And he was uh, super fun and everybody loved him. Yeah. And it does, one of my early thoughts did go to friend of the show, Sailor Hawkins. Yes. And wonder what they're true. gonna do as an homage. But they're gonna have to do something. Yeah, Ashes of sure. Sea, I don't know what, but. I don't know, perhaps. All right, well, now we're all down. See, that's why I wasn't gonna bring it up. I, that's why I stopped myself. I know. Well, but I it, do think it's important that we mention him because he's such a, a part is. of the fabric of many of the books we've read on the show many of mm -hmm. the things we've watched many of the everything and i've been trying he, wasn't to he also a sparks fan i would not shock me i feel like he was in that one too i did uh, he's not in the film because he's not I, in wa the film. I watched it again this weekend just to get okay. ready uh i have been sharing on our tumblr page yes a few tributes and such i don't know if you saw the marquee of the roxy in la yes very nice where they said there goes our hero mm -hmm. and i'm sure there'll be more of that and i did yes. see again somebody else saying that the tributes that roger taylor and brian may paid were sort of that's yes. the thing that would really he would have been honored by and the fact yeah. that they were both rogers like, was amazing i love was like saying like he was in our band for all intents right. and purposes so I, I didn't know if you could fill 200 pages with people talking about punk drumming, but you can and and then some and easily. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, people's reactions to the concept for the book were all over the map, right? Because there would be that reaction of like, what are you going to say about drumming? Um, and I think that uh, uh, for some reason with drums, 
people out of the gate automatically start thinking technically. They start thinking about math and playing. And I was actually more interested in the stories around people's journeys to how they became punk drummers and their mm -hmm. experience being punk drummers and the kinds of punk drummers and musicians and music that influenced them on that journey. So it's more, it's more a book about the stories behind punk drummers than it is an, a manual on how to play punk drums. But even, I mean, the one thing that I would like to consider myself well-educated in the subject of music, but uh, you mentioned the D beat, the D drum beat. Yeah. I'd, I'd never heard of this before. And then I like go to YouTube, look it up and, oh, of course I know that sound, but I'd never heard that phrase before. And the fact that so many people throw it around one, I felt woefully underinformed. Um, but this seems like there's certain touchstones of drummers and bands that everyone seems to gravitate to and, and name check as, well, this guy was, was the one for me. Yeah, I mean, any musician, I think, is going to have like the things that they're gravitated to in that really important phase when they're making the transition from strictly being a fan who loves the music to thinking that they can actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the people that are influencing you in that transition or just before that transition end up being really important. So for pe for the guys, guys for me were like uh, Grant Hart from Who's Do, Bill Stevenson from The Descendants, uh, DJ Bonebreak from X. Uh, these are the drummers that I was listening to as I was discovering punk rock. Uh, D.H. Peligro from Dead Kennedys, which was actually the first punk band I heard. And it just about ripped my head off the first time I heard it and kind of started this journey to my discovering and embracing punk rock over the next couple of years. I was like 12 years old when I heard it. So before we bring Heidi in, uh, Chris Mars? Yeah, Chris Mars Influence? is great. Yeah, I was just guessing from the T-shirt. That perhaps <laughs> this is this is the cover of a Husker Du record, but somebody put the replacements. Oh, yeah. uh, it is. Oh, I got yes. it. I got it on Etsy. <laughs> I have awesome. to buy it. It's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, no. Chris Mars is actually a fantastic example of like somebody that people don't often point to as a drumming inspiration, but he is so perfect for the replacements on those first few records, like in particular, Sorry Ma, which is like my favorite replacements record of all time. I love how scrappy they all are, right? As, as a new drummer, as a novice of somebody who's like been raised on Neil Peart of Rush and knowing I'm never gonna be that kind of drummer to hear the replacements and respond viscerally to what they're doing. And in particular, the kinds of drums that Chris Mars is playing within the context of those songs it blew my mind. So yeah, he totally influenced me. How much do you think drummers and, and sort of drummers and successful bands, is it that confluence, that Venn diagram of the right drummer for the right band? Or is it any drummer can find a place in a band and it's just finding out how you fit? Because you mentioned to your Chris Mars example, someone who's super scrappy and just kind of fits in with the ethos of what the Stinsons and, and Paul Westerberg are trying to do with that band? Yeah, I think it, it's a great question. I think that that's true, not just of punk drummers, but I also think you look at somebody like Keith Moon in the early phase of The Who, he was just the right drummer for that band. He had just the right energy, just the right manic energy uh, for what The Who was doing at that time. John Bonham, can you imagine him playing with anybody but Led Zeppelin? Um, <laughs> And then I think within punk, what you get, or at least what I experienced with like early punk was, you know, somebody like Tommy Ramone, who was never a drummer. They just couldn't find a drummer that could play the way that Tommy had envisioned it. And so he takes on the drums and consequently his style is really iconoclastic. It's very straight ahead, very driving, very few fills and frills, but he sets the template for what punk rock drumming sounds like moving forward. Uh, you take somebody like Rat Scabies from The Damned, like that guy is just beating those drums within an inch of their life. And on that first stand record, you're kind of hearing him learn to play. I mean, you've been playing a bit before that, but you're hearing him learn and exploring in those songs. And there's like a visceral reaction and an energy that comes from that kind of approach to music and drumming. And so that's the stuff I was always really attracted to. One of the things, uh, this is a question and also a name drop. So it covers all of the bases. Um, one of the things I thought was super interesting was the fact that the, the variety of influences that 
the people who are writing in this book name checked and the education level of some of these drummers too as musicians their musicianship varies and we interviewed Richie Ramon and he talked about the fact that and credited his experience playing like in jazz like bands at high school and stuff and was saying like the Ramones drum beat if you do four four you know 18th notes or 16th notes all the way it doesn't work right it's got to have just a little bit of a, a swing and a move to it and that adds that percussion or that propulsiveness to it how were you surprised by how educated some of these guys were you know when you're going by the name rat scabies you're not expecting <laughs> you know a deep philosophical conversation but oh, I, yes you are okay well we go to different parties i think is what that <laughs> is. <laughs> Anyone who could come be rat scabies would know it all. Fair, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's it's worth noting, and this gets pointed out in Ira Elliott's opening essay in the book, that rat scabies actually invented gobbing, which is yeah. the practice of spitting on bands. Yes. Uh, and which is, I, see, I rest which, my case. <laughs> should be on his headstone. Uh, you know, he's still first, alive. I, but I'm saying, <laughs> no, eventually, as like, eventually, eventually first, yes, and he's first still line alive. of his obit, you know, is. I will take this to debate class any day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> I got two great points. <laughs> That's all I need. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I'm a drummer myself, right? And so I've known drummers and I've known a lot of musicians and, and you learn pretty quickly that everybody has a different story and a different path to how they got to the point where consumers or listeners are hearing them. Like if we hear them on record, um, but, you know, you look at somebody like uh, the foreword is written by Lucky Lehrer from the Circle Jerks. He's a trained jazz drummer. Uh, DJ Bonebreak from X, who I mentioned earlier, is a chain, uh, trained jazz drummer. There's also the self-talk guys like uh, Rat Scabies. And, you know, Rat Scabies in my interview with him talks a lot about how um, being self-taught and being a garage rock style drummer forced him to be inventive in a way that really nobody else can do because he's not about rudiments. He's playing like rat scabies and no one except a rat can really play like rat. And so I think there's a lot of different ways that you can get to being a musician and get to the point where you're recording in a studio. And then it's just a matter of playing to the song and being the right musician and being the right fit for what the band is trying to achieve. And going through the book and obviously rat comes up a lot, but mm -hmm. And all, it's almost, I, it's hard. It was hard for me to find a list of favorites that Lucky wasn't on. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, he by far was he by far the one who was truly like the. If you had to pick the best or the most that everyone loved the most, I feel like it's him. He gets pointed out a lot. I mean, and I for really good reason. I mean, yeah. you talk, where the Circle Jerks come on the scene in that hard, that early hardcore scene. Lucky's playing wasn't just the forbidden beat, which is sort of like the oompa beat. And dun, dun, dun. He could do that. Um, but if you listen to a song like Red Tape, I mean, he's playing the fastest tempo in the world, but also insane single stroke drum fills that are all over the map. And it's like, you can hear him attacking the song. You can hear him attacking the drum kit. And I think it's a hallmark of the kind of drummer he was in the circle jerks. So he gets name checked a lot. When I first started doing research for the book, um, Chuck Biscuits from DOA, he went on to play for a lot of other bands, but I specifically speak with Joey Shithead from DOA about Chuck uh, and, and how Chuck was a kid that was just like hanging around playing bongos in the background, right? But he's somebody that people really love to point to. Um, Spit Sticks from Fear is another one. Um, getting into the, uh, into the later 80s and early 90s, Derek Plord from Lagwagon, phenomenal drummer. Uh, he gets name checked a lot. Obviously, Trey Cool from Green Day gets name checked a lot. Um, you know, so generationally, you will see these trends start to emerge and certain names pop up a lot. Actually, and I won't mention him again, but Rat Scabies comes up the most. He's there referenced the most. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, it's like he's here with us. You have to keep mentioning him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, it's true. I, that's true. He definitely, his name definitely came up the most as a reader. Like it popped up the most. I just felt like Lucky was on the, like on the favorite list the most. He's, he's uh, incredibly influential and really well-respected. Yeah. So of course my favorite, and I won't spoil it, but the, and I, I won't say it correctly, but the five, I think it was five things that are punk as fuck that you wouldn't expect. 
those were stellar. Uh, Sherry Page? The, yes. Yeah. And all of her choices were fantastic. Yeah. I mean, if you're going Karen Carpenter, then you really know drums. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you said it. I didn't spoil it. You said it. But it yeah. was fantastic. And it makes sense. And it's so true. Yeah. And she, you know, I love that she's also talking in that same list about Sheila E. Exactly. She's talking about Karen Carpenter. She's yes. talking, uh, she's talking about Blink-182, right? Yes. Like it's, it's, she's just, she's right on. Like everything she's saying is right on, in my opinion. And she's a current drummer. That band Thick is, is a young punk band that's yeah. recording, I believe, for Epitaph Records. They're really great. Um, and I love that her influences are so diverse. And, yes. and I felt that way also about like Uriah Hackney, who's uh, the drummer for Rough Francis. And, you know, there was a documentary that came out, I think, 2012, about a band called Death, a proto-punk band from Detroit. Did you guys mm -hmm. see that? Mm -hmm. So. Oh, but yeah, right. Uriah Hackney is the son of one of the members of that band. And so he was one of the kids that grew up suddenly finding out that his dad who had been and his uncle who had been in a reggae band his whole life had been in a proto-punk band. And Uriah and his brothers were in punk at that point. They were playing in punk bands at that point. So there was this whole thing that happened with that family. Awesome. But what's beautiful about it is, and I love this sort of like these uh, synergies that happened throughout the book is, what he, Uriah lands on, um, Dennis Thompson from the MC5 mm -hmm. uh, and the drummer from the Stooges. Like he's yes. looking at these old Detroit drummers as his favorite drummers only to find out his dad and his uncles were in this Detroit proto-punk band. So it's like, there's like this beautiful, happy accidents that are happening all over the place in the book, which is I think a function of having so many different perspectives. Yeah. When you, you know, you talked about sort of the number of influences. When you just look at the folks who contributed to this, who appear in this, you know, Heidi mentioned Lucky, um, you know, the fact that you got Mike Watt on record talking about, you know, and, uh, you know, Gina Shock gets a shout out, which I think is- She gets a few too. As mm -hmm. well-deserved. I feel like yeah. one, the Go-Go's are not the Go-Go's without the punk drumming in the background to keep it all together. And the folks like Dre Cool and then, you know, personal hero Stephen McDonald is there anybody McDonald. yeah is there anybody <laughs> that you were like oh man if I could just get this person because it seems like you really this book covers it all oh thank you I, I tried really hard I mean I started off with the wish list quite honestly and the wish list unfortunately looked a lot like like what my peachy folder would have looked like in high school it was just sort of like <laughs> west coast hardcore drummers from the 80s did you just and draw I, the like band logos all over your list? Over and over, <laughs> over and over. I can still draw a really good DK. There um, you go. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I realized pretty quickly looking at the list that it was going to be a pretty claustrophobic book because it wouldn't be perspectives on punk drumming. It would be perspective on perspectives on mostly SST drummers from the middle 80s, uh, which isn't <laughs> as interesting a book. So Agree to disagree, but. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but so what I did is I flipped to the idea of a timeline. Uh, and I was like, what are the beats? Oh, that's a bad poem. What are the beats I have to cover um, within this book to actually make it seem all encompassing? And uh, once I did that, then it allowed me to broaden that list and go after specific people. Um, there, almost everybody that I approached was incredibly supportive of the idea, immediately got it, saw the need for it. Um, not everybody had the time or the inclination or wanted to write anything or, you know, so there are a couple of people who remain on my wish list, but they will remain nameless. Um, I knew I was in good shape when I, uh, when Mike Watt said yes, uh, when I was able to get an excerpt from D.H. Peligro's book, because we're both on the same publishing company. Uh, when Jim Ruland, uh, who's a fantastic punk writer, was able, was able to write something about Bill Stevenson of The Descendants. And then I think, you know, again, Betty Horowitz from the Gaslight Anthem, John Worcester from Super Chunk, uh, you know, uh, I, Mindy Abovitz, who um, she's a drummer, but she also started the only all female magazine called Tom Tom Magazine. Yes. So it's only female drummers, awesome. uh, you know, uh, and, and somebody like Bon Von Wheelie from Girly, uh, Girl Trouble, which is a you know, Pacific Northwest garage rock band or Lynn Perko Trull from the Rex and the Dicks. As the name started coming in, I just was pinching myself all the time because I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm actually talking to so many of my heroes about so many of my heroes. Um, so I'm glad that came across. What was the thing that surprised you the most? 
I, I think it was those, those happy accidents that I'm talking about or something that Luke referenced earlier, which was um, that people, you start to see patterns forming about the kinds of references uh, people are pointing at. Um, because I didn't, I knew that that's what I wanted to happen, but I didn't know for sure that it was gonna happen, that the breadth of diversity within those, uh, those influences would be there. And then as it came together, I was feeling a real big sense of relief. And then I was just feeling this sort of sense of wonder at, at um, so many of these people that I consider influences and heroes had the same influences and heroes as I did, right? And there's like this beautiful connection that kind of goes back to, we all start off as fans before we're musicians. You, know, you say, you know, once you got a couple of these folks in place and they fell where you're like, okay, we have a book now. And there's so much that I learned throughout reading this. I mentioned the the use of the term D-beat and what that actually is. And I was like, oh, this is wonderful. Were you learning stuff throughout this process as essays were coming in, as you were talking to people? Were you, you know, given your expertise on the subject matter? Were you kind of going, wow, I never thought about it like that? Every day, every essay or interview or top five list that came in. I would learn something new or at least would get a different perspective on something that I thought I knew uh, before. You know, I mean, I've done, this is the third book of this kind of format that I've done. I've done two previous books with a co-editor, Paul Myers, and those were about power pop. And it was the same kind of thing where we would have a bunch of contributors uh, giving us their perspective on the genre of power pop. When I decided to do this one on my own, I really liked that format, although I added listicles into it and I added interviews into it. And uh, what that does is it kind of creates this sense of like, imagine a cocktail party and you're going around from cluster to cluster of people exactly. and every cluster is having a different conversation, but they're all talking about the same subject, which is punk drumming in this case. And so that's what it really feels like to me when I read the book. And believe me, I had to read the book about 75 times in the editing process. <laughs> um, I'm well familiar with it, but it's like every time I had that sensation that oh, these are interesting people with interesting thoughts about a thing that we both care about. Was there any essay or even just a quote that made you kind of rethink any of these musicians that you had perhaps underappreciated until somebody said, no, check them out? I think that um, my friend Eric Beatner, um, prior to doing these music-focused nonfiction books, I was writing crime fiction. I published a few books in the crime fiction genre. Eric Beatner is another really fantastic crime writer who's publishing a lot of books these days. But he grew up in uh, just in awe of the DC punk scene. And I learned a lot about his perspective and what it was like to grow up as a teenager adjacent to that and to be just like, basically it was like a religion to him. So I thought that was really interesting. I thought John Worcester's list was really interesting. You know, I mean, he's, he's calling out Gina Shock, but he's also calling out like uh, the meat puppets. Um, and you know he, he's talking specifically about what he does to get in shape before he goes back out on the road yes. and the songs that he plays along with. Um, so that that's got this like multi-dimensional aspect to it because you're is a working drummer, highly respected working drummer. He's also hilarious. So of course his top five list is really hilarious. But I I took a lot away from that one. I love that. Though. I love those like peek under the tent of what it's like. How do you condition to go back out? And his was great. It's they're all great. And the, the format you did, it, it's so on top of, you know, everyone's talking about this shared love. It's so digestible in the way you did it. You know, I mean, it's a quick read, but it's a quick read that you, you retain it. You're not like, what, what was that? It all comes to you. And, and I think that's fantastic. Oh, wow. That's really nice of you to say. Yeah. I, you know, I think I initially went out with the idea that I was going to ask everybody to do an essay. Um, and not everybody has the time or the inclination or thinks of themselves as a writer. And so I was like, you know, for maybe I'll just interview a couple of people and we'll sprinkle those in. And then as I was putting those together, I kind of realized, you know, a list would actually be really interesting here because it's, it's more like a quick bite, right? It's like, you can read it in, in a quick sitting, um, but you can also read it as a chapter. But then within that, you're going to get five influences and those five influences are going to make you go listen to those bands. Absolutely. And really at the end of the day, that's what I want people to do. I want people to occasionally put the book down and pull that song up on whatever medium they want to listen to music on mm -hmm. and like experience it through the, the eyes of a drummer, 
right? Because we all listen to our favorite songs, mostly through the vocals and the, and the melody and the guitar lines. But once this, beat gets, once this book gets under your skin a little bit, you'll find yourself kind of listening with the drummer's ear and you'll go, wow, I never realized that drummer did that right there. And I've been listening to this song for 40 years. Forbidden Beat, Perspectives on Punk Drumming is available right now wherever you get your books. That includes places like your Barnes & Noble, your Amazon, and of course, a place like IndieBound. You can also order it directly from the publisher Rare Bird Books, where they are at rarebirdlit.com. You can also follow author and editor S.W. Loudon on both Twitter and Facebook, where he is at both places at S.W. Loudon. You can check us out on all the various socials. Be sure to visit our website at rockandrollgradschool.com. And don't forget to leave us a review. Today's show is produced by myself and Heidi Hegquist. Our reluctant producers are John Sauvé and Sandy Stone. Our willing producers are Rachel Allen and Randy Jeanette. Our intern is Zach Jackson. This one's for Philippe. Thank you, good night, and may all your favorite bands stay together. Stay together.